Hello and welcome to this lecture. My name is Joe Stroll and I teach environmental studies at Malmö University. I'm going to be making a number of lectures in preparation for, among others, RIT students participating in the Urban Ecology course in Malmö, Sweden. This lecture has to do with Skåne and Malmö and I've written that it is from the Holocene towards the Anthropocene. Actually, as you'll see, this lecture starts at a time period, a geological time period, much earlier than the Holocene, but we need to understand some of that to understand why Skåne and Malmö looks the way it is today. Today, the agenda for this lecture has three primary points, or three primary parts. First, it is a more geological kind of lecture. Second, I will move on to seeing how Skåne transitions from being a part of Denmark to a part of Sweden during a number of hundreds of years of this change. And third, I will say something about present-day Malmö and the surroundings in Skåne because we can't just look at an urban area detached from its surroundings. So we're going back into the past, a considerable period of time back into the past here. We're going back, so far back in time, uh, before we can uh, see anything that looks sort of similar to Europe or North America. Those of us who have studied geology know that before we had the existing plates, and the world consists of a dozen large and then maybe a dozen smaller kind of tectonic plates, that in the past there were places which were called cratons. And these were the origins, the center part of some of the plates that we see today. And through millions of years in the past, in the distant past, cratons formed um, and then they added on, there were, there were parts of, of sediments and other things which were accreted, added onto the cratons, and we had collisions, and we had subduction, where one plate is going under, under another one, and uh, we have separation again. And this was occurring during hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of years in the past. Uh, and then we arrive... Um, relatively close in time uh, to, so we say, uh, 60, 70, 80 million years ago, uh, when the world looked approximately like this, or at least some of the world looked like this. Uh, and what is now Africa and what is now Western Europe, or parts of Africa and what is now Western Europe and parts of uh, North America and South America were, were together as one continent. And then we have separation that begins. We have the beginning of the formation of the Atlantic Ocean. And we have what we see, the Atlantic Ocean. If we removed all the water, we have what we would see then instead. We can see that down the middle, between South America and between Africa, and between North America and Europe, we see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where during uh, uh, tens of millions of years the continents have separated from each other um, and, and this is because, because there's upwelling of magma which is occurring here uh, and then as the, the magma has cooled and is far enough away it begins to subside away again. So we tend to have heavier kinds of, of um, rocks and minerals at the bottom of the oceans like basalt and we tend to have relatively light kinds of, of bedrock in the center of continents where the cratons originally were, were made of, say, for example, granite. This is a process which is ongoing, and if you have an opportunity to visit Iceland, uh, you can see uh, on land this rifting which is occurring, as opposed to have to be in a submarine or have a map where we've moved, removed all the water, so to speak. And now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the geology uh, and moving closer to Skåne itself as opposed to this more global kind of scale. And here we have a map of, um, shall we say, European Europe, um, exclu excluding the most eastern parts of the Ural Mountains. Um, 
also excluding uh, parts of the Caucasus, which are considered to be part of Europe. Uh, and we can see, this little red area here is Skona. And Skona can be thought of as a location in Europe which is a, in a transition zone between the Scandinavian or the Finno-Scandinavian shield, which actually extends uh, into uh, White Russia, the Ukraine, and Russia, but it is covered in sediment, sediments, um, and the more sedimentary areas and, and, and rocks that we find in northern Germany and parts of France, and then eventually we start to come closer to Africa, and there's a lot more of volcanism uh, and small plates uh, that have uh, been added on and become part of the European plate. Skona is also lying along the lines of what is sometimes referred to as the Tornquist zone or is part of what is sometimes referred to as the trans-European suture. That we see here that, that the original, this Baltica area, like a craton at one point in time, and then we see other areas that have been accreted and added on to that through millions of years of time. And it isn't just that it's been added on like that, it's the Iberian Peninsula is actually twisted around. The landscape north of Skona is quite different than, say, the visible landscape in northern Germany. Continuing onward. Now, when you are in Skona, and when you're in Malmö, of course, when you're in Malmö, you're walking on uh, sidewalks, city streets, across squares, in buildings, and so forth. But if we imagine for a moment that we remove buildings and roads and other kind of infrastructure, what kind of rock would you be standing on when you were in Skona? And I think that this map of Skona, this sort of uh, geological map of Skona, helps demonstrate this that we see that there is a distinction um, approximately going from the northwest to the southeast, and this Tornquist zone, this trans-European suture, runs right through Skona. And what we see in these sort of banded patterns in general is that there is a transition from the northeast towards the southwest in general. There are exceptions to this, of course. And we see different ages of the bedrock, uh, not the topsoil, which is, you know, very thin or perhaps um, a number of centimeters thick, uh, but I'm talking about the rocks, the soil, which is immediate below uh, the topsoil. To use an American terminology, perhaps, what do we find a few feet below the actual surface? A meter or so, maybe below that. What we see here is that the, shall we say, the largely pink kind of uh, rock here, uh, this is uh, a metamorphic or igneous, it was formed below the Earth's surface, or, or has otherwise been weathered down, that there was additional kind of ancient rock that was there before. Now if we walk around in some places there, there is topsoil, there are things growing there, uh, and there could be farming land, uh, but this is the sort of just below the surface kind of rock that we would find. And then we see the areas that are more green and blue, uh, and green here as well, uh, that these are areas where we have sedimentary bedrock. We dig down a few meters, and that's the kind of sediments we have. Now, of course, we have, we have uh, layers of earth on the very top, transform, transformed by vegetation after the most recent ice age, or that sediments have been pushed up or other forms of rock have been dumped there on the part of glaciers at the end of the most recent glaciation. Here again, a red circle showing us where Malma is located. Uh, and all these sedimentary materials that we see there, depending upon what period of time in the past they were deposited in place, I've written that this was during the tertiary geological period, millions and millions and millions of years ago. And here we have a line which is going uh, 
Well, we'll start here. It's going from approximately the uh, northeast and it's going towards the southwest. And if we were able to look at, in profile, this sort of line here, what would it look like? Ah, well, that's the next part of the picture. And yes, of course, there's water there and so forth. But uh, here we have um, hundreds, uh, we have meters, and it says 500,000 and so forth, uh, much further down. And what we see here is that when we come to this direction here, we can see this ancient bedrock. We can see this green area here corresponding to this sort of sedimentary plain, low-lying plain here. And then we move our way through in the direction towards approximately Malmo, and we can see what it would look like in profile. If we look much more closely, we can see here in part of the map uh, a number of black uh, triangles. And this is from a period of time when there were volcanoes in what is now Skona. And so we have intrusion of basalt, a dark, heavier kind of material. And if you know where to look, you can go around and you can see the remains of these, these small hills, the magma chambers that at once upon a time were one, two, three kilometers below the Earth's surface, and now that they've been eroded away higher, uh, the levels of the volcano, that's what's left. I've visited one of those, I'm, and I have the plan of visiting additional ones, but they're sort of out of the way and hard to reach, some of them. What about if we sort of temporarily remove the geology and just look at the topography? What does Skona look like and the most adjacent areas of, of uh, Denmark? The island of Hreland, or in English, Zealand, where Copenhagen is located. And we can see again that, that we can see this sort of northwest, southeast trending lines. And we had on our previous map, we had this sort of line that I had drawn from approximately here in the um, northeast towards the southwest. So we see the lay of the land is sort of in folds, so to speak. It looks like that, at least. Now in Skona, a lot of the area which is more hilly consists of what is referred to as a host and a graben. A host is an area of higher land and a graben, like a word grave, has actually sank. The host has risen in relationship to the graben, or the graben has sank in relationship to the horst. And these horst in Skona are referred to in Swedish as os. This is a ridge of some kind. Uh, and in Skona the ridges tend to not be very high. We're talking about uh, 50, uh, 150 meters higher than the surrounding area, perhaps. In some places the the fall of the ridge is rather steep, in others it's, it's much more gentle. Now, in most of the rest of the Sweden, when you hear somebody talking about an os, they're not talking about a host. They're instead talking about either an esker or a moraine, a glacial feature formed during glaciation or as the glaciers retreated. Uh, because these words in Swedish existed before we understood how these geological, geographic features have been, have been founded. Now, there are glacial oaths in Skåne, and of course they're much smaller, or they're eskers or moraines. But in general, when we talk about an os in Swedish, in Skåne, we're talking about what we see here. And uh, the most important names for these features we see here. It almost sounds like a lecture in Swedish. Uh, Malmö again here. Lund is located there. Helsingboy, Helsingborg, as you might say, is located there. And we see here Hallandsåsen, Söderåsen, Romlåsen, Lindredsåsen, and Nevligåsen. Locally there can be additional names uh, for this. And actually, we can see that it seems like this is all one 
sort of piece, so to speak, where these are much more separate. And then we can see suggestions of additional kinds of ones there. And then we see one uh, which is not called uh, an os. Risbaiet uh, is located there on the border between Skåne and another province in and another province in Sweden. Another historical province in Sweden, I should say. Now I'd like to superimpose the one image on top of another. So what we see here is that I have a sort of base, the previous map, we can see that sticking out here, uh, where we can um, see uh, the topography, the lay of the land. Low areas being green and yellow, high areas of being red. And on top of that, I have placed this more geological map. And I also have uh, the names of these low hills or ridges rising 50, 100, 150 meters or so above their surroundings, approximately. And now I'm going to add in that line, which I showed before. And we know Malma is there. We can see um, that, and I'll zoom in on this, we can see that there are some lakes there, in various locations here of a considerable size. Um, and now I've drawn this uh, arrow, and I'm pointing to that line there, a particular place, and I'm about to take you outdoors, and we can see what the countryside looks like. Between these ridges, this is a depression, the Vom Depression. Not an economic depression, but it's lower, and it's called in Swedish Vom Senkan, and it gets its name from this lake called Vom. We're going to start out there, right around the tip of the arrow, uh, and then I'm going to move towards the lake, and, and we can see what we can see. So let's uh, sort of punch in. Uh, facing approximately south from where I'm standing right now. So I think and I hope that you can see that there are these low hills to the south. And now we're facing uh, uh, sort of to the north northeast approximately, I guess. Let's see if that's right on the map. And I'll punch in a bit and you can see how the land rises um, or you might actually see a vehicle driving on a country road there. Now we understand and we know that Skåne and all of Sweden and indeed all of Scandinavia has been covered several times by glaciers during ice age periods of time massive bodies of ice several kilometers thick. And during periods of time when the glaciers retreated from their mass maximum extent in northern Germany, they ex ex retreated further northward from here, uh, there, there would be the line of ice, the area would look like a tundra, and then after some hundreds of years of maybe the ice not moving all that much, we would have a new period of withdrawal of the ice. Where we are right now, in this area near Lake Vom, where the Schävlinger Creek flows from Lake Vom all the way out to the Sound, the Ölesund, separating Sweden and Denmark. And by the way, it looks like it's flowing back towards its source, the lake, but it's very windy, so the wind is sort of blowing it a bit, that, the surface of the water. But in the past, when glaciation wasn't quite complete, this whole area where we are now was like one huge lake. A number of meters um, of water would have been above me. And past, uh, in, in the direction of the sound, there was a barrier stopping the water from flowing out. So, come with me and we'll have a look at the lake itself, Lake Vom. So, I put a fisheye lens on and maybe that wasn't such a good idea. But the whole point of this was try to 
show a few meters above the lake the approximate size. This is the end of March, so uh, not very many leaves on the trees, none at all. So like I was saying, um, at the end, at some point at the end of the most recent ice age, uh, the level of the sea, the not the sea, the level of the lake might have been just right behind me. And then we have Vom Lake itself. Much further to the west, perhaps uh, five, six kilometers from the Ölesund, there was some sort of ice or earthen dammed area. There wasn't much water that was going through. I, and then that broke up and everything was emptied. And what we have left today is, for example, this Vom Lake, which is about 12 square kilometers. Uh, it's about 20 meters above sea level, uh, and um, what else can I say about it? Uh, its deepest point is maybe 10-15 uh, meters deep, and there are some other uh, small lakes in this kind of valley, which is actually a depression between Romelosen and Linderadsosen, in that direction. Uh, the Graben and the Horst the two on either side there. I think when you look at the countryside in some places in Skona, when you look at the vegetation, you look at the lay of the land, uh, and if you take Skona as a whole, it reminds you to some extent of some parts of upper state New York and some parts of not near Toronto, but some parts of southern Ontario, like from Lake Ontario going north into the Canadian Shield. That's because in the northern part of Skona, we're starting to move in the direction of the Fenno Scandinavian Shield um, with the very little topsoil in many places and a forest full of spruces. What we find in Skona, a typical kind of tree, is a beech. Um, and I I can also say that a few other things if um, you're going to be walking around in the countryside and not just staying in Malmo or Helsingborg. You don't have to worry about poison ivy or poison oak or poison sumac because there isn't any. Uh, a plant that you are more likely to have a problem with would be, would be a nettle. Uh, they're, <laughs> not, they're not everywhere, but you can see them in a fair number of places and you can just avoid them and not touch on the underside of the leaf or the stem. Um, you can see these sort of hairs and you'll, you'll burn on that. And then of course, just like you have in the United States, an invasive species, giant hogweed. We have that in Scandinavia as well and in Swedish it's called Jättebjörn loka. Very strange name. So, welcome back uh, from our excursion out in the middle of Skona. Now, we have our original geology, the formation of the materials that are beneath the surface for millions and millions of years. And then, during the Pleistocene, in other words, the geological time period that was before the Holocene, and the Holocene uh, began approximately 11,000 12,000 years ago. During the Pleistocene, which stretches much further back in time, uh, we have periods of ice ages. We have at least four ice ages where uh, we have um, 100,000 years, 200,000 years, a very long period of time uh, when the planet is relatively cold and ice sheets have spread out from northern regions and southern regions. It's not just Greenland and Antarctica which are covered with ice during these ice ages. And then we have comparatively warm interglacial periods which tend to be much shorter between the ice ages. And this means that in the places in the world where the ice sheets have spread out, um, that there is a sort of scouring of the landscape. That the topsoil, the vegetation that existed, is just sort of pushed and wiped away and dumped someplace else. We also have periods of time where the glaciers are advancing and then melting and calving at the very end uh, and they have transported various sort of rocks with them and these get dumped in some places. 
And so we, in the middle of nowhere, have a large boulder, sometimes referred to as an erratic boulder because it doesn't sort of fit in otherwise. Now, the glaciation periods have names. Everything, of course, in geological history has a name if it's important enough. And if we are in North America, the most recent glaciation is called the Wisconsin glaciation. And we can see in this map the greatest extent advance of glaciers during this Wisconsin glaciation. We can see that essentially all of Canada is covered in glaciers. Since the now, this doesn't mean that during the most recent Wisconsin glaciation we have from the north some sort of rapid advance of glaciation and it stops there and then it's like this for a hundred thousand years or longer and then it retreats. No, we have the sort of height. We have periods of time when glaciation is more extreme and less extreme. So we could have during the Wisconsin glaciation that maybe areas in nor the northern United States were not covered by glaciers. So glaciation means that we have some sort of a, a bulldozer effect, but also that materials can be deposited in various locations. It sort of rearranges the top of the landscape. Now, depending upon where you are in the world, which continent or which part of the continent, the different glaciation periods have different names. And here we are in Western and Central and Northern and Southern Europe. Again, we see parts of what is considered Europe not included here. Uh, we see, you're generally speaking, the Ural Mountains are considered the eastern edge of Europe. We can see that there's glaciation in the northern part of the Ural Mountains. We see that in on Scandinavia, the British Isles, uh, and then in the Alpine areas, but also the Pyrenees and so forth, that there was a great expansion of the amount of, of, of ice and glaciers and permanent ice sheets. Uh, in the northern part of Europe, this is called Weichel, and uh, in the Alpine regions, it's called Vum. Now, it's not on the exam. Ha ha. You don't have to know these, but you can just sort of see if you run across these kinds of texts. What's well, something easy to realize is that in both Europe and in North America, the most recent glaciation has a name that begins with the letter W. Now, when several uh, kilometers thick ice sheets are depressing land someplace during an ice age. Um, this means that some of the upper kilometers of the surface of the continent where the land is on is going to be depressed downward. It's understandable. Ice is heavy. If it's thick enough, just like putting dirt, there will be some sort of a depression that takes place. And at the height of the most recent uh, ice age, when we had ice caps and extended ice areas through a large part of what is now Alaska, um, large parts of Canada, parts of the northern United States, the British Isles, Scandinavia, into the very northern part of Germany, uh, lots of places in Siberia, and so forth, but also in the southern hemisphere, the South Island of New Zealand, Argentina, Chile, and so forth. And so, as more ice was formed. This fresh water has to come from someplace, and it's coming largely, of course, from the oceans. The amount of salt in the ocean is, is going to increase slightly, and the sea level is going to fall tens of meters. As more and more ice accumulates in the thicker places over Canada, over Sweden, Norway, Finland, and so forth, there'll be increasing pressure to push um, and though the increased pressure will pu push uh, the earth down in that area, and though actually be the seemingly solid earth is actually sort of flowing, that some of this material is being moved away uh, from where the ice is thickest. As the ice age begins to end, as the ice begins to thaw, of course we have lots of water flowing into the oceans, the sea level starts to rise, but as the ice retreats, as the ice thickness is, is reduced from several kilometers down to maybe only 500 meters in some place, and the ice continues to retreat, then what we have is the potential and the actual occurrence that the land that was depressed starts to rise. This occurs first in the place where the glaciers retreat and become thinner. In Europe, this of course would be the more southerly parts, northern Germany 
Denmark, for example. The ice continues to retreat um, towards uh, the north of Norway uh, and Sweden and Finland, and we have more land that's starting to rise. This land rise after the uh, retreat of the glaciers is called post-glacial rebound. It's also sometimes referred to as isostatic rebound. There are a number of different terms which are used to describe this, perhaps depending upon the discipline, the profession, the area of studies. So, more and more places in Scandinavia and in Sweden, where we are now, rose because of the rebound effect. All at the same time, sea level was rising. So locally, during a number of hundreds of years, perhaps the sea level was rising faster than the land was rising, and in other places, perhaps the land was rising faster than the sea level. And so there's evidence here and there of there being shorelines uh, that, that are higher than the present shoreline, and there are submerged shorelines. This... Um, process has been going on for thousands of years. The process of isostatic rebound or post-glacial rebound in Skåne has stopped. Uh, and in fact, in some places in northern Germany, in the Netherlands, and in Denmark, there has been some sort of sinking of the land. It's like a rebound of the rebound effect, we could say. Whereas in many places in the northern half of Sweden, in Finland, and in Norway, this rebound effect is still occurring. And in some places in northern Sweden, and if you look at the diagram, you will see that there are light green areas and yellow areas and almost orange areas. And there we have five, six, seven, eight centimeter rises of land every year that's taking place. And sometimes there are very mild earthquakes which take place there as there is settling and there's this continuing rising of the land. This rebound effect uh, that we see in this map um, will continue for a number of thousands of years. I'm not a geologist. I don't know how long time it's going to be, but I know it's going to be a number of thousands of years and it will probably be at some point slowing down as well. So the rebound effect isn't over. And right now, on the coastline, on that map that you saw there where it's very yellow, the rebound effect is clearly much faster than any sea level rise because of human-induced climate change causing there to be um, higher temperatures and more water in the oceans from glaciers on Antarctica and Greenland melting and so forth. Plus the thermal expansion of water is also another effect. Now in our next diagram we can see uh, the various kinds of um, geological periods in the past. We have moved uh, in my story here from the period of time when uh, what is uh, present-day Europe and North America collided and then at some, time, at some point split apart. We're talking about tens of millions of years ago, moving towards the present time. What we see at the very top, besides the vehicle and the humans standing at the very top, is we see the top layer is called the Holocene. And it says there that this started approximately 11,700 years ago. This was when the Ice Age uh, ended um, and there was a, a rapid retreat of ice. Actually, the Ice Age in some ways maybe ended already in the previous geological epoch called the Pleistocene. About 19,000 years ago, the last um, five, the, la the, la sorry, the last 7,000 years of the Pleistocene, there was no more glacial advance, and there was in fact the beginning of some kind of retreat. During the last ice age, during the Pleistocene, the uh, glaciation was advancing and retreating, advancing and retreating during certain periods of time, and now there was a clear retreat that started to take place. Now, up until about the year 2000, most geologists, most natural scientists were in agreement that the Holocene, we were still living in the Holocene. There was a change that took place those 11,700 years ago approximately, and uh, now we're living in the Holocene. And about the year 2000, uh, Paul Kreutzen uh, became someone who advocated the concept of the Anthropocene, or the Anthropocene. 
It wasn't his idea, but he's associated with it. There were other people that had the idea that perhaps we had moved into a human-influenced, and perhaps nowadays a human-dominated geological epoch. A geological period where humans, one species, become one of the, at first, one of the most dominant and then the most dominant species on the planet. Now I'd like to talk a bit, not all that much, but a bit about soil quality and soil fertility. The amount of, of, of ability of supporting large number of plants uh, and so forth. How many nutrients there are on the soil. We call back to this map where we had the host, for example there, and the Graben, for example there. Uh, the Graben is the depository of sediments. What we see here is that the the soil tends to be uh, have more nutrients, be more fertile, uh, and so forth, and that the soil the level of soil is much deeper before we start running into rocks, uh, as opposed to the top of the host and on the host, they tend to be relatively poor. Um, it's harder for, material, for, for vegetation to break down uh, this surface. We have poorer topsoil that's located there, relatively speaking. Now this doesn't mean that, that the soil quality and the ability to carry out intensive agriculture is the same in all areas of all these various graben. It varies. And as I said before, we have this period of time of glaciers scouring and scraping away the topsoil and depositing the soil in other places. But what we see in Skona is we see, again, another kind of pattern. We have this kind of pattern like I was talking about, north, uh, west to south, east, and then going this way from uh, the north, east to the south, west. And we can see when we look at vegetation and uh, agriculture and forests and so forth, we can see some sort of a repeat that we can see areas that are primarily agriculture and less dense and mixed forests versus denser forests. Let's have a look at this. So I took the previous map and we can see the areas which are relatively um, where we can see where there's a lot of agriculture which is occurring um, either in the form of, of growing cereals, grain and other kinds of crops or pastures with, with uh, sheep and cows as an example and then we see the areas which have much more dense kind of forest, perhaps planted um, with a spruce and pine. Whereas some of these other areas here, mixed in with the agricultural land, we see much more deciduous forests or a mixture of coniferous and deciduous forests. I'll be talking more about trees in Skåne in a bit. So now we've moved from the more geological kind of description as the backstory to what humans can do in this particular area and what more relatively recent human history is about. Of course, we have a period of time when people are moving into what is now Scandinavia as the glaciers are retreating and they see something that looks like tundra. This was happening thousands and thousands of years ago. And then with more receding of glaciation, it's easier to hunt and gather. And then at some point, um, agriculture begins to be practiced more prevalently in, in Scandinavia. But if we move to more recent history, now I'm talking about the last 2,000 years, so to speak. The area that we think of today as Skåne uh, was not part of any particular country at one point in time because Scandinavia, if you go back and for, back enough in time, consisted a number of, of minor kingdoms and chiefdoms and fiefs and so forth uh, where there was an elite or a strong man or a series of strong men who were the sort of apex of society a warrior class that were deciding over particular places and sometimes they fought each other and, and so forth. And we have much further south uh, 
in Europe, we have the Roman Empire rising and falling, uh, and there were contacts between the Roman Empire and what is now Scandinavia, but that's a little unclear, and we'll just leave this out. So, we don't know for sure if Skåne itself ever was united under one king or one particular person. This may have been possible, or it could have been that Skåne had, say, six or seven locations where that you had a particular person that was like controlling a very large county, so to speak, of, of land. Um, in negotiations which the Danes had um, with Charlemagne in the 800s, in the delegation that the, uh, that, the, that was meeting Charlemagne's delegation, because this was the, the beginning of, of, of an attempt to establish some sort of empire in the 800s after the fall of the Roman Empire, and the Danes wanted to have peaceful relationships and not have a war with this uh, large organization, Charlemagne's empire. But in the delegation, there were two people uh, that are mentioned, which are from a place which sounds like they were from Skåne. They were sort of not part of Denmark, but associated to Denmark. But we reach the late 970s, you know, over a thousand years ago, and there was a Danish king named Harold Bluetooth, in English. Blotand uh, would be approximately what his name, last name was. Uh, whether he actually had blue teeth or not is unclear, but his name was Harold. And he is the first or second king of Denmark, uh, because it's a little unclear how much of Denmark was controlled at one time, and so forth. And he seized, grabbed a hold of, all or most of Skåne. And this is when the formal integration of Skåne into Denmark begins. And what we see here... This is the map on, on the left, it's the map on the right, sorry about that. We can see the areas that are red were part of the Danish kingdom, and we can see of course that there were parts of present-day Norway and very far western Sweden, and essentially all of present-day Denmark, uh, which uh, were the sort of core Danish territory, and then the yellow areas that were either influenced by the Danish kingdom, whoever was the king at that time, uh, or were vassal states or somehow connected to that. And we can see Normandy in France, we can see these areas of today, present day northern Poland and northern um, Germany, uh, Skåne and other places in southern Sweden and large parts of Norway. Whereas the majority of what is now Sweden and Finland were another kind of political area, not under the control or influence by the Danish kingdom. Now some of you might be saying to yourself, Bluetooth? I've heard that name before. And what we see here in this symbol here is an H and a B which have been put together. And the Vikings and other northern Germanic peoples um, had an alphabet which was the runic alphabet. And what we can see is that H and B looked like that, and when you put those together you get this symbol. And the idea was uh, those that were um, behind, those in Scandinavia, originally from Scandinavia, that were behind the idea of establishing a, a sort of close radio connection between computers and other device, electronic devices, um, they were going to call this Bluetooth. And this was because the idea that these Harold Bluetooth and later Danes were sort of connecting people in a local area, and it was a tribute to this first or second king of Denmark. A curiosity. And we can see in various places this icon. Uh, and here we he see the flag from Skåne. Uh, there's, um, it's been adopted to this kind of flag, and we can see that all the Scandinavian countries' flags have this kind of cross, uh, but with different colors and different proportions. This is much more like a square kind of flag, whereas the Swedish and Danish flags tend to be more elongated.
So I borrowed Google Maps, um, or whatever it was, and here we can see a picture. Copenhagen, Malmö and Lund. I've written them in some kind of English, and then we can see the Danish, Copenhagen, Malmö and Lund in Swedish. So we have not only a Harald Bluetooth establishing a unified Danish kingdom and incorporating or beginning to incorporate uh, Skåne and other places into this Danish kingdom uh, in about 970, we have that in the past the capital of a country was wherever the king was at a particular time because the king was uh, the president, the prime minister, the judge, uh, the parliament, the congress, and so forth, all in one person. Uh, there might have been a council of nobles that advised the king, but it was wherever the king was, that was the capital of the country. And if the king was moving around to various places and maybe fighting battles and so forth, the capital is where the king was that particular year or that month or whatever. And sometimes the king was running his country during times of peace from a castle of some sort, either his personal castle or somebody else's castle where he said, hey, move out. I'm going to be there for a few years. Uh, but what we see is that slowly through time, in, in the Middle Ages, that capital cities start to be formed um, and the kings are there more often, and that something which seems like a present-day parliament starts to be established in some cases, although they could be located in various places where the king said, I want to hold a parliament, a meeting of nobles and other important people, next year in this city in the month of June, be, make it so. Uh, and then the king showed up, and there was this discussion, and the king left, and the people went home again. Uh, but then we start to see the beginning of a capital city. And this is a slow process where Copenhagen, at the very far east of the present day, Denmark, it becomes the capital. But if we go back in the past, Copenhagen, at one point of time, was much closer to the center of what was the Danish kingdom, because Denmark had lands further to the south uh, in the east, um, in the Baltic states now, for example. Lund, which is uh, by this point in time, around the year 1100, is firmly within part of the Danish kingdom, um, the decision is made that the Catholic Archbishop of all of Scandinavia will sit in Lund. That will be his location. And of course there's a sort of geography of the church divided up into dioceses and districts and so forth, um, but that's where it's going to be. So we can see that Copenhagen is becoming more and more important in the Danish kingdom, and Lund has become a very important place in, shall we say, the religious uh, perspective. Uh, we can see that they are separate, but there is a sort of a connection, which there's no time to go into the lecture about that now. What about Malmö? Well, Malmö at this time really wasn't a place. We come to approximately the 1200s, and it's clear that there are some houses and some villages uh, on a sandbank, or perhaps there are two small villages on the coast, on the sandbank, and then inwards a bit um, past the present-day southern part of the canal in Malmö or maybe further south. A little unclear, but maybe that's not the most important part of the story. And by 1275, not only was there a, a tiny little village for or hamlet for Malmö, for the people that were living there, but it started to become an important transit point. This is one of the closest points, if you're going to go to Copenhagen, to go over to Skåne, if the king needs to talk with the archbishop, if the archbishop needs to talk with the king, or whatever and there could be merchants that need to go back and forth. So we see that initially Malmö is arising between two different kind of important places in Scandinavia. The slowly emerging capital of, of Denmark and the, for a few hundred years, the most important religious uh, uh, location for all of Scandinavia. Later on, there are divisions, and Trondheim is its own, and Archbishop, and so forth, but that's into the future. So in this sense, Malmö arises as sort of like a, an important location to go by land to get on boat, or back and forth. Uh, 
Uh, and if you're going to go from Copenhagen to Lund in the past, well, uh, you're probably going to be going by a sailboat, and if the winds aren't the way you want it to be, you're not going that day, maybe you have to go another day. And when you've arrived in Malmö, it might be late in the day, and you're not just going to walk to Lund. So even though these locations are quite close to each other, you might need to spend the night in Malmö before continuing on to Lund. And you might need to wait in Malmö until the winds are favorable, or you have enough people that are willing to row you across to Copenhagen. Now, I'm going to refer to the Scandinavian countries and kingdoms as sort of cousins. And we have a, a long period of time after this, uh, when I'm talking about the 900s, 1100s, and so forth, uh, where um, the Swedes and the Danes, and to some extent the Norwegians, are fighting each other. And they're also collaborating with uh, groups of merchants and princes and kings and so forth in the northern part of Germany, or they are fighting against them and they're trying to take charge of their own trade. And there's something called the Hanseatic League, uh, a group of merchants that became very powerful in what is now northern Germany into northern Poland, uh, into present-day Lithuania and so forth, but also in the Netherlands and had offices in London and other locations. So what we see is that there are a series of projects that are taking a long period of time to establish nations. We had originally in the past, far enough back in the past, say during the Viking era, 700s, 800s, 900s, um, where we had a number of small chieftains and then slowly we try to begin to unite these into more regional powers in Scandinavia and then finally we start to see something which looks like Norway, Denmark and Sweden. Denmark and uh, Sweden, or what will become Denmark and Sweden, they're going to be in this long term, centuries, several centuries long sort of fight to determine who's going to be the boss, who's going to be the major power, and who's going to be the secondary power in Scandinavia, and who's going to get to control Norway, uh, and perhaps who's going to um, more easily expand into what is present-day Finland or other places in, in, in Europe. Because of a common enemy, the Hanseatic lead of traders, that were causing the Scandinavians problems, or at least some of them, um, in, in what is now northern Germany that I mentioned before, Denmark manages to unite all of the Scandinavian countries into what is referred to as the Kalmar Union. And it gets its name from a, a town in present-day Sweden which is called Kalmar, which was sort of on the border between Denmark and Sweden at that time. Uh, and so in the late 1380s, the early 1390s, under a, a Danish queen, Margarethe, uh, she managed to unite uh, all of these uh, locations. And we see in this map, uh -huh, not yet, we see in this map at about the year 1400, we can see what uh, the Kalmar Union looks like, of course. Uh, and we can see that um, in this map that Denmark extends down into parts of northern Germany, we can see, the, well, the Kalmar Union, Denmark part, we can see how large parts of Finland are now part of the Kalmar Union and stretching along the coast and Iceland. Um, we can see these islands, uh, the Faroe Islands, uh, the Shetlands and the Orkneys are part of the Kalmar Union. Svalbard has not been discovered. Greenland is claimed to be part of the Kalmar Union, but it's just a name only. Uh, because there's not much happening there, at least from a European perspective at this time. The Norse colonies in the western part of Greenland had died out hundreds of years ago, uh, but were somehow remembered, the, these lost Vikings. And the idea behind the Kalmar Union was, of course, to, to be a sort of a balancing power against the economic powerhouse that existed in northern parts of Germany uh, as part of the Hanseatic League. Uh, now, this union wasn't entirely peaceful because it was dominated by Denmark, at least from a Swedish perspective, 
Uh, and uh, Swedish nobility always felt like they were being shortchanged, and there were occasional uprisings and problems. Uh, there was also a, um, an event which is referred to as the Stockholm bloodbath, where Danish troops killed off a large number of nobility in Stockholm in the early 1500s. Uh, and so at one point, one of the more minor nobility at the time, uh, named Gustav Vasa, or Gustav Eriksson Vasa, or whatever his name was at the time, uh, and other revolutionaries, and I've written this as revolutionary, from a Danish perspective, uh, perhaps we would consider these to be terrorists, using uh, present-day language. From a Swedish perspective, we might consider them to be freedom fighters. It all depends upon who's writing the history. Anyway, during the 1520s, um, they managed to kick the Danes out from much of what is Sweden today. Not Skåne, and there are other locations that, that they didn't get them out. And this began a long history of wars between the Danish kingdom and the Swedish kingdom. For at least 200 years. Sometimes with other countries involved in this. And the general trend was that Sweden was a rising power and Denmark was perhaps a contracting power. If you have Danish background, sorry, but that's just the way it was. Uh, and about a hundred years later, uh, and, in, uh, and we have this about a hundred year uh, period from about 1610 to 1710, uh, that the Baltic Sea starts to look like an internal, it's the Swedes that are controlling it. We see the Baltic Sea here, with these various kinds of bays, which are almost like seas themselves. And we see that in 1658, this is the height of Sweden, the Swedish kingdom, almost thinking about maybe we should become an empire. Temporarily, this middle part of Norway is controlled by Sweden. We can see these places in northern Germany, like around Bremen, um, uh, and so forth. And we can see present-day Estonia, parts of Latvia, where uh, modern-day Russia, St. Petersburg, is located, uh, and so forth. And this, then, is, at least in Europe, uh, the largest that Sweden ever got, to some extent at the extent of uh, the, uh, the loss of the Danes, but also taking over territories here to the, uh, to the east. In North America, we know that there have been uh, Spanish and English and French colonists, and there have been various attempts on the part of these colonial powers to establish and maintain territory and extract resources from the, that part of the world at the time. The Dutch were also there doing this, uh, which is why New York once upon a time was called New Amsterdam. Uh, but the Swedes were also in the area of the lower Delaware River Valley and uh, near uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, there's much less of a sort of legacy of that in that particular area in the United States. Whereas perhaps the Dutch legacy is a bit uh, more um, stronger there. American presidents with Dutch-sounding last names. Roosevelt, for example. Sweden also had a number of outposts, together with the Danes and others, in parts of what is now the coast of Western Africa. And I'm sure that they were not just treading, uh, trading items. I think that there was some slavery involved here as well. But Swedes don't like to talk about this, and most of them have no idea that this actually took place. This was a short-lived uh, kind of experience on the part of, of, of Sweden, very, not very long-lasting. Sweden uh, has also had part of an island in the West Indies. But by and large, Swedish colonization outside of, of uh, Northern Europe is uh, essentially non-existent compared to other uh, colonial powers. Uh, now, we see in the past, like I showed you, about how Malmö was this transit point in the 1200s between the religious capital of Scandinavia and the emerging capital of the Danish kingdom. Uh, when we come into the 1600s, Malmö has become a location in its own right. Um, uh, Lund and Malmö may be about the same size, I'm not sure, Copenhagen is larger and so forth, uh, but um, in the 1660s it seems like that Sweden has finally taken over Skåne for good. Uh, Sweden had temporarily taken over Skåne from time to time, but then there were peace agreements and the Swedes uh, 
uh, left Skåne. But now it looked like that the Swedes were here to stay, even though the Danes didn't like this and continued to fight on and off. So Skåne needs to become a, a part of Sweden, and so does Malmö. And, and something has to happen here, because here we have these people in, in Skåne which are speaking Danish, or a language very similar to Danish, or a variation, and a, a dialect of Danish, and we want them to be speaking Swedish, or something like that. And we want the clergy, the uh, now no longer the Catholic Church, but a Lutheran Church, we want them to be beholden and connected to the Swedish king, and not have connections to the Danish king. Uh, because, of, of course, uh, the church was controlled when it became a Protestant church and was no longer a Catholic church and not controlled from Rome. Of course, the church was in part controlled by uh, the nobility and particularly the king. And to control the commoners, you needed to have control over the religion because the commoners were going to church every Sunday and listening to what the person was giving the sermon about, and maybe didn't just talk about religion, but talked about what a great guy the king was. So in 1666, Lund University is established, uh, and that's probably to show that it was such an ecclesiastical uh, center, a religious center, and a lot of uh, teaching in what becomes a religion, uh, in what becomes a university in the beginning, has connections with religion. Do we need to train the priests? and the ministers and so forth in our state Lutheran church. Um, there are lawyers that need to be trained there and so forth. So it made sense to put the university perhaps there. Sweden is uh, to a great extent controlled by so-called governor generals between 1658 and 1720. It's some sort of quasi-martial law uh, where the governor general decides a lot whereas in other parts of Sweden there would have been another kind of government system that was there. Um, after a number of decades uh, we reached the early 1700s and the Danes realized that it's probably not such a good idea to fight for Skåne anymore uh, and we probably should hold on to what we have. We see that Malmö has, is a fortified island with fortifications around um, and then ramparts, and then we have this castle, uh, which um, present day doesn't really look like the castle looked like once upon a time. Um, the language of Skåne today we can consider to be Swedish, but it has some sort of, as I've written here, a Danish accent. Uh, actually, we can say that the local dialects in the countryside in some places have retained links back to Danish, that there are some words which are completely different if you speak to older people in the countryside. Now, um, when I'm saying that it has the, the local version of Swedish and Skåne has a Danish accent, that is uh, perhaps from the perspective of people further north in, in, in Sweden, say in Stockholm, the capital, and other places. If you talk to Danes, they don't think that the Skåne accent is particularly Danish. Uh, so it has lost a lot of the Danish qualities, it has retained some of them, and it's developed its own um, specialities in terms of some words and ways of pronouncing things and dialect and so forth. So uh, let's look a little bit more about the growth of Malmö um, as it is starting to become an integral part of Sweden, and ultimately as today now is the third largest city in Sweden. Uh, and some of this, and we can see similar kinds of developments in some other places in Skåne. This map is from uh, 1677, and we can see that there was an attempt at this time on the part of the Danish army to take Malmö back. There was some sort of uh, armed forces, the Danish army to the south, and we can see the city as it looked like at that particular point in time. There were um, no buildings and no streets closest to the fort because there was a need to be able to have a clear shot from the fort. If the town was taken by an invading army, then the, the troops within the castle would still be able to shoot at those troops that were coming. No point in having it linked to the town itself. But the town does have um, uh, defenses around it, as we can see. And we can see that there are a number of roads, more like dirt paths or tracks, which were a bit wider than uh, smaller ones, uh, 
uh, and we can see that there are certain locations uh, there. Some farms, some groups of houses and so forth. Now Malma, of course, uh, ha well, maybe not of course, well Malma has, has uh, developed because of its coastal location. In the beginning, uh, there was no real good harbor. You would just sort of bring the boat up to the shoreline, beach it, people would get off, and then you would re return. Uh, and we see that there is an effort to establish something more like a proper harbor. And we can see in the area that I've marked in blue that we see this area that's sort of sticking out into the sea, and we can see what it would have looked like at one particular point in time. Uh, that there was some sort of a surface there, that there were uh, huts and sheds for storing things, uh, and that certain ships could come and load and unload right there in a somewhat more practical way than just sort of beaching your ship. And uh, while the history of Malma is not just about expansion along the coast and then reclaiming land, and, rec and, then, and then reclaiming... Uh, land from the sea, uh, this is a very important part of the history of Malmö. Uh, and the picture in the upper left was the idea in the 1850s about what was going to be planned, what the harbour was going to look like. And we can see that the, the, uh, um, the castle is still sort of separated from the rest of the city. There aren't any houses or streets there. And we can see that going north from uh, the center of the city out into the sea, out into the Ölesund, was the sort of triangular shaped land area that was going to be built with um, the maintenance of, of a passageway water to be able to reach the canal in that particular area there. Uh, there was no plan for any kind of railway at the time uh, in, in the 1850s because it was unclear if there would be a railway there. Uh, if we look into the future, we can see the background here, 1870. We can see in this map what has been built out now, and that by about 1870, these areas of the harbour had been filled in. We see this sort of harbour area here, this large area here. We can see on the edge here that the train station has been built, uh, and that they have made sort of squarish kind of blocks for warehouses and industrial facilities uh, along the, the harbour, the dockside, and so forth. Uh, and if we look, we can see two pictures from about the uh, 1880s. Here we can see, uh, um, going out from the centre of the city, where we see the western and eastern harbours on either side. Um, and we can see here this, this little building here, which still is in the center of the city, but has been moved around. This was the harbor master's office at one point, and I'm pointing to, with a green arrow here, uh, to a bridge. We can see what I've uh, put in here is the lighthouse, located about there, in that picture. And we can see the lighthouse also in that picture, the same lighthouse. And you can see that today uh, on the same block in the city where some of the Malmö University buildings are located, but it's located to the north. Uh, and a yellow arrow pointing to this building here, which is across the street from the train station. Still there. And this yellow uh, building that I've talked about, this is sort of white yellow, this is much more of a yellow, the Harbour Master's um, uh, house. The Harbour Master was paid a wage, but also given a, a free house. Not uncommon. And so what we can see in the present day is we can see that particular little lighthouse is still there, and we can see it through this sort of artistic something or other near the train station. And here we see this green building, which is one of the Malmö University buildings. To give you a sort of perspective about, even though many of the buildings that we see near Malmö University buildings uh, are relatively new, built within the last 50 years or so, and particularly some of the Malmö University buildings are built in this century, so they are just uh, 
a couple of decades old, or at, at most. And here we see this building across from the train station, and here we see this Harbor Master, um, which is now some sort of a restaurant, uh, cafe, uh, beer hall, something or other. This was when uh, this uh, Harbor Master's uh, building was being moved because of the tunnel, the rail tunnel going under parts of the city. There was a concern that this would be undermined and so they just moved it and then moved it back when everything was done and we can see this uh, green bridge here because of the green painted there it's it's the remains of when there used to be uh, actual freight rail lines uh, that were going to various places around the harbor and uh, the city has just sort of kept it there you can see that how it could sort of rotate around to let a ship or a boat, not a ship, go through the canal in that particular place if you go there and see that when you are actually in Malmö looking at it. So the development of Malmö has been very much connected to um, harbour activities and connecting out to the rest of the world through the harbour. By land, of course, also to places in Skåne and then further away, but this sea connection was important. In this picture, which is a few years old, uh, we don't have some of uh, the Malmö University uh, buildings and, and so forth that's there. The purple line, which I have drawn here, is the old original coastline. The red line here, which continues along here, is the coastline that has been built out. And this is somebody's idea of perhaps in the future uh, we need to build out uh, some sort of coastal defense in case there is a rising sea level because of climate change. And then we can see these uh, sort of um, mini skyscrapers uh, that have been built since then. I've written um, Niagara, which is the name of one of the university buildings because the, the block that the university is on has that name. Um, the street block, so to speak. and the, uh, So we can see these buildings here when they were in construction, and we can see the canal, and we can see over here, that's where um, the castle, the defensive castle, not the sort of nobility kind of castle that existed there. Uh, yeah, right, I forgot to say. Um, the uh, Western Harbor tour that I will, the virtual tour that I'll make will be in that area. So, moving on to the urban areas and their surroundings. What can we say about the vegetation which exists um, in Skåne? Of course, in city parks, in Malmö, say, we can decide exactly which trees are going to be growing there and we can protect them in some ways if the winters are, are rather bad. But what kind of trees do we find either naturally occurring or have been planted, um, not in people's backyards, but in other places in, in Skåne? Uh, we can find in some places that spruce and pine have been planted. I will consider these to be forest planta plantations. Uh, and particularly the spruce can be common in more northern and eastern plates, uh, parts of, of Skona. It shouldn't, there shouldn't be as many of them as there are. It's not really a tree which is native at present for uh, Skona, but it's planted there for economic reasons. Recently fast growing all the same height, chop them down. Even if there's selective logging, um, you do that, and then that's used for, for wood or for making paper. Uh, and now, um, as a sort of uh, botanical and also Swedish lesson, we can see that spruce, Picea, uh, which is called gran in Swedish, and we see pine, penis, or tal. Uh, and we're actually supposed to be writing the botanical name in uh, italic, uh, but since this presentation is in English and I'm writing Swedish in there and we should write the foreign language words in italic, I decided to underline the botanical names. Otherwise, uh, the perhaps the most common tree in Skåne is a beech tree. And you can see 
the name uh, there as well. And we consider that if, if humans sort of disappeared and uh, we didn't have the plantations of particularly spruce, then we would see that beaches would be much more dominant than they are now. And a, a beach forest in spring uh, seems to be one of the sort of typical kind of views of what Scona is like in wooded areas. And here we see an example of what it could look like. What other kinds of deciduous trees are commonly found in Scona, either historically uh, or at present? Uh, here I have a list of several other trees that we can find. Uh, and I've written elm, uh, but there aren't all that many elm left to be found because they've also been afflicted by disease. Um, but we can see in English alder, birch, elm, hazel, maple, oak, and willow. Uh, and besides the beech forests, something which we often see in Skona is that um, along small water bodies like streams in agricultural areas, we might see rows of willow trees, some kind of willow, part of the Salix uh, genus. Um, and um, what th this has been used traditionally was that you would cut off some of the upper branches um, from time to time and you could use that uh, for weaving baskets and for making other kind of materials out of it or maybe some kind of a broom with the thinner parts of, of that. And so another kind of typical scone of view in the more heavy agriculture areas is that we see uh, approximately two, three meters high, maybe four meters high, we see rows of sort of stunted uh, willow-like trees growing near the water. If it's not a, a real stream, it could be that it was created when um, the agricultural land that they, they drained some of it and then the water flows to there and then flows out to a real proper stream at some distance away. And you can see this as well, and you can see that one that's been growing for a while, you see this sort of furry, fuzzy ball. And then when they've cut it, and in the wintertime, you see that it's this sort of like a head on a, on a stick. Um, and as a sort of a way to sustainably use this kind of uh, wood material for a long period of time and then occasionally replace the willow trees if they've died, that you could extract something from it um, and use it in, in agriculture for hundreds of years. A typical kind of view in Skona. So beech and willow are perhaps some of the more iconic kind of trees in Skona. I was talking about the need for food, but also other kinds of materials for people in cities. So uh, let's have a quick look at the agriculture we can see that in general, and this is an extreme generalization, that in the southern and western parts of Skona we can find potatoes, grains, uh, what I believe is called canola in the US. Uh, the proper botanical name is Brassicanapus, which I should have had in uh, italic, but I didn't. Peas. Uh, I didn't write sugar beets. I should have included that. So add that on, sugar beets. And then we can see, uh, close to cities and other locations, large greenhouse facilities for growing tomatoes and other things year-round uh, for cons consumption in Skåne, but also for sending north to some other places in Sweden. If we're more to the north and east of Skåne, then we will see some of this, of course. Uh, you can see uh, Brassica napas, canola, and it's also, shall we say, besides beech trees, willow trees in the particular way they're cultivated, and canola. Uh, these are also sort of iconic kind of things for the landscape in Skona. Uh, but to the north and east, besides this, you will find more dairy and more poultry and more beef cattle and other kinds of animals. A general sort of picture. Of course, you can find poultry closer to Malma and you can find grains being grown in, in more fertile areas in the northern forests of Skona, but this is approximately the way it is. Now Skona and three other locations in um, Sweden are usually thought of as the breadbasket of the country. 
the main areas of, of intensive and heavy agriculture of all kinds. Uh, and for this reason, in Skona, there has been this need to make sure that cities did not expand out into the countryside too much. Smaller villages that become towns should retain some kind of a density. Um, and th for this reason, whereas in the United States and some other countries, you see what is referred to as urban sprawl. And so what you see in instead in a country like Sweden, and in particular these areas that where agriculture is very important, is that the cities are, are still rather dense. Yes, there are um, suburbia-like areas, either separated and detached out from the city, um, places like uh, Staffanstorp and Schävlinge, outside of Malmö and Lund, um, I think of right away of being quasi-American in some ways, um, a sort of a sprawl, but even there in many cases, the yards are not nearly as large as what you had historically after the Second World War in the United States. Uh, so we want to have save the farmland from so-called development uh, because this is an important resource. And you can see that the, the political area of the city of Malmö uh, is, the majority of it is an urban area, but there's still agricultural land to the south, which is actually being farmed, but the city is encroaching on it. And I believe that in a number of decades, there won't be nearly as much farm left, land left in, in Malmö. <laughs> and if the sea level rises faster than most predictions, then the city will have to move more inland, and maybe all the land in the city will be built up. Food and the food processing industry is extremely important in Skona. You can see a number of companies which have grown out of the need to process food uh, and to package it. Um, Tetra Pak, um, which I'm sure that you have uh, used food packaging and have bought food packaging in the United States that's packaged in Tetra Pak or something like that, originated in Lund. Uh, and there are a number of other kind of innovations and agricultural companies that exist in various places in Skona. Um, and then on top of that we see other things that uh, in, when we have a, a proper industrialization in the 1800s and later um, that, that we see other kinds of things like shipbuilding, garment industry, uh, and much later in the 1970s, 80s and 90s in electronics and programming and etc. kind of industry in the area. Coming to the end, um, I thought I would talk about uh, what we have in the area of nature preserve and areas for recreation and natural parks, national parks. Uh, and there's also something called Natura 2000. I'm going to advance the slides so we can see this. We're going to begin by showing, I'm going to begin by showing you that because of the high population density, even though we're trying to keep people in the cities, uh, and, and the heavy exploitation of agricultural land. Um, there aren't all that much in the way of national parks in Skona. In fact, there are only three. Uh, the largest one is on this ridge, Söderåsen, the Söderåsen National Park. The next largest one is called Stenshuvud, along the coast there. And then there is an extremely small one located there outside of Lund, near a place called Dalby. This was the first national park in Sweden, and there's this area of forested land that some people thought was indicative of the way it looked like in Skona before industrialization and before a mechanization of agriculture and, and, and so forth. And so this area was important to set aside. And then much later it became clear that that's not really the way a forested area in Skona might originally perhaps have looked like. Uh, but we still have this tiny national park. Uh, quite small. And here's Malmö and Lund and Helsingborg. And I don't know if you're going there, but here is Kuhanstad, Kristianstad, if you try to say it something like in English. Those might be some of the locations that you visit most often as somebody from the RIT uh, Urban Ecology course. Let's add on a bit here. Uh, the green areas are uh, nature preserves. Uh, 
Now, what is meant by a nature preserve can vary between various political jurisdictions. There are various kinds of protected areas in Sweden which are covered by the blanket term of a nature preserve. You might have a nature preserve uh, near where you live in some other place in the world, and the decisions about that and how it's maintained might be quite different than some of these nature preserves here. But some kind of management of the area for particular species to protect them and or for human recreation. And they can also be based in the sea. So we see all these areas in green. Uh, and then finally we come to the so-called Natua 2000 areas. And some of these are at sea, but there are other locations there. And uh, Natua 2000 is a sort of a collection of two different kinds of environmental protection which is instituted at the continental level via the EU. Uh, there are bird protection areas and other areas of special conservation as it's called. Sometimes these overlap with existing nature preserves and you can get a sense of that. In other cases if we think about for example birds, migratory species, they need to have protected areas in a variety of different countries within the EU as part of a network of environmental protection. Um, and as I said, sometimes there's an overlap between a nature preserve and a Natura 2000 area, and sometimes not. And so we can see these areas in red on land that uh, were not originally a, a nature preserve, um, or have perhaps become a nature preserve um, after receiving the Natura 2000 status. It's just a catch-all name to describe all these kinds of, of areas that are protected in two pieces of what we could call EU legislation. Actually, they're not legislation, they are decisions. Uh, but that's politics and political science, and that's another kind of lecture. Uh, reaching the end here, I have uh, indicated on this map uh, four locations, um, which are recreation and nature protection areas that might be relatively easy for students from RIT in the Urban Ecology course to either, they, you might be visiting it, as part of your program, or potentially you, you might have the possibility of visiting on your own time if you're interested. You know, during some years uh, the course goes to Kuchanstad and you take the train there because quite close to the center of the city is a, a nature preserve and there is an exhibition and learning center uh, connected to that. Um, so you can get a sense of that particular part of, of Skåne. We have the National Park at, uh, at uh, Sörösen, the southern ridge, so to speak. You can take a train from Malmö to Hö, and then you can take a bus there. And as I hope you understand that public transportation um, and, and so forth in, in Scandinavia is, um, at least in the more urban areas, is really well established and is relatively frequent as opposed to, say, the United States, which outside of New York and Chicago and Boston, a few other locations, is of the standard of a developing country, if I'm going to be mean. Or maybe not mean, if I'm going to actually be realistic. Two other locations, um, we can see this area here. A location much closer to Malmö. Uh, I'm going to call this Hekeberia. There's actually more than one nature preserve there. It's near a, a small town called Jenop, and you can take a bus there, um, and um, and you walk from the bus stop, either to the east or to the south or to both, and you could spend a whole day walking around there, in uh, somewhat forested and somewhat open terrain there. And then finally, here in the northwestern tip of Skåne, we have Kullaberg, which you might call Kullaberg, perhaps. You take a train to Helsingborg, and then you take a bus to Mölle, which is located near there, and you walk. I think this would be a, a whole day excursion, getting up early um, and going there. Whereas uh, here could also be a whole day, but it's much easier to reach Kuranstad. This could also be a whole day, as well as this. Now, I know that you might not necessarily be here because of your great interest in nature if you're taking an urban ecology course, uh, 
but if you want to get out of Malmö and you want to experience something quite different, you have those possibilities. And if you have a, a rail and transit pass that covers all of, of Skåne, those are some places you could go to yourself or together with other, other people. Uh, alternatively, there are a number of other locations uh, which are much closer and reachable by public transport, transport. So that's the end of this presentation, this lecture, uh, but my plans are to have more. So thank you for your attention and I hope that you found this uh, useful and interesting.